Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian. In this video, we're going to be taking an analytic approach to limits, that is, the function f of x is going to be described by formulas, not by graphs. And in particular, in this video, we're going to be considering limits where you have to do some important canceling inside of the limit in order to be able to get the limit. A key concept that we will be uh, considering in this video is really the most important concept of the first month of calculus. And that concept is the following. When you have a, a ratio, a divided by a, when can you cancel and, and why can you cancel? All right, the tools that we'll be using are the same tools that we've been using for the last couple of videos, these properties of limits in theorem two and uh, theorem three about, in particular, limits of polynomial and rational functions, uh, theorem four about limits of quotients, and then a definition of what's going to be called an indeterminate form. So our first example is going to involve this function f of x. This function is called a rational function because uh, it's a ratio of polynomials and uh, it's uh, provided here in two forms, the standard form and the factored form. In question A, we're supposed to compute some y values. That is, we're supposed to find uh, f parentheses c for these different values of c. All right, well, to start with, uh, I want to point out that uh, although this standard form of a polynomial in, uh, in, in rational functions may be a more familiar form, when you're computing y values, the factored form makes the computations easier. So let's do our computations. I'll point out that we can cancel negative 2 over negative 2 because negative 2 is not 0. So f of 1 equals 2. Let's compute f of 2. So f of 2 equals 3. And the key step here is knowing that we can cancel uh, negative 1 over negative 1 uh, because we know that negative 1 is not 0. Now let's compute f of 3. f of 3 does not exist because uh, when we plug in x equals 3 we get this expression and that expression we're not allowed to cancel 0 over 0. In that expression. We have to compute the numerator and compute the denominator. When we do that, we get 0 over 0, and we cannot cancel 0 over 0. Now let's find the limits as x approaches c for these three different c values, 1, 2, and 3. So again, um, although the standard form is more familiar, we're going to use the factor form of the, of the function uh, for the computations of the limits. So let's compute the limit now as x approaches 1. At this point, notice that we have a rational function and the number x equals 1 that we are supposed to uh, use as the location of our limit. That number x equals 1 is in the domain of this rational function. So let's make a note of that. Now let's remember what we're supposed to do in such a case. Go back up and look at our um, theorem 3, limits of polynomial and rational functions. Theorem 3 says if we're taking the limit of a rational function and the number c is in the domain, then we can compute the limit by just simply substituting in the value of c. So let's do that in the current situation. So the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is the number 2. And notice the important step here. Uh, this step uh, here, that equal sign is because of theorem 3. Theorem 3 says I can replace this limit with just the expression you get when you substitute in x equals 1. 
And then the other important step was this equal sign, the fact that we can cancel it's because negative 2 is not equal to 0. Now let's compute the limit as x approaches 2. All right, as before, we have a rational function, and the number 2 is in its domain. So we can use theorem 3 here as well. So the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is the number 3. And again, the important steps are this equal sign, where we use theorem 3 to tell us that we can replace this limit with this expression, which is just simply substituting in the value x equals 2. We're allowed to do that because x equals 2 is in the domain. All right, now let's compute the limit as x approaches 3. Now, the question is, what happens here? Um, this limit uh, is of the following form. We're taking the limit of a ratio. And if we try substituting in x equals c, look what happens. So I'm going to put this in kind of red. So that would look like this. So if we try to substitute in x equals 3, we get to this situation where we have a 0 on top and a 0 on the bottom. But the thing is, this step is not allowed. That is, if you go back up to our limit properties, I can take the limit of a ratio by just simply substituting in the x value as long as the denominator does not turn out to be 0. And if we go back up and look at our other limit properties, uh, if I take the limit of a ratio, I can just take the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator, as long as the limit of the denominator does not turn out to be 0. So, so what I did down here is not allowed. This step is not allowed. So this is not allowed. If we were to do this, we would say that the limit does not exist. But this step is not allowed, so we cannot do the limit this way. So this form of limit, where we substitute in the number and we get uh, the result 0 over 0, if we were to substitute the number in, that limit form is so important that it's given a name. That kind of limit is called an indeterminate form. So none of our limit tools apply to this case. So how do we proceed? Well, the key is to think about when we can express, simplify an expression of the form a over a, where you have some number. Remember, at the beginning of this video, I said this was going to be uh, one of the most important concepts for the uh, first month of calculus. If we know that the number a is not 0, we can cancel terms to get a over a equals 1. But if a is 0, then the expression a over a is, is 0 over 0. That can't be simplified. It's undefined. Now, notice that we saw both of these kinds of things happen in part a of this example. In part a, um, in two cases, we were able to cancel could cancel in this case because negative 2 was not 0. We could cancel in this case because negative 1 was not 0. But in the third case, we could not cancel because we cannot cancel 0 over 0. So when you have a ratio, and you'd like to, a, a ratio of something divided by itself, and you'd like to simplify it, it's crucial to know whether that thing is known to be 0 or not. Now, let's go back to the current situation. Remember what we're trying to do we're trying to find the limit we're trying to find the limit of this expression and if we were to substitute in x equals 3 we get 0 over 0 but we're not allowed to do that again if you, if substituting results in 0 over 0 that tells you you can't substitute so what do you do <laughs> 
Well, the important thing to, to realize is that we have this symbol. We're taking the limit as x approaches 3. That tells us that x is getting closer and closer to 3, but not equal to 3. So since x is approaching 3, we know that x is not equal to 3. So that means that x minus 3 is not equal to 0, so we can cancel x minus 3 over x minus 3. So this allows us to proceed with the limit. So let's do that. So this is, again, the most important step of the first month of the calculus course is, is knowing when you can cancel. So I'm going to explain very clearly here why we can cancel. So there's my explanation of why we can cancel. Again, that's the most important step of, of the first month of the course. Now notice what I did is I, I, I had a limit expression here. I copied down the entire limit expression again with the limit symbol, just that I canceled those, uh, those two factors, x minus 3 over x minus 3. Now at this point, we have the limit of a polynomial, so we can use theorem 3. So the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 is the number 4. All right, let's summarize our results of parts a and b and consider what they tell us about the graph of f of x. So in part a, we found that f of 1 was the number 2. What does that tell us? That tells us that there is a point on the graph at x, y equals 1, 2. In part b, we found that the limit as x approaches 1 is 2. This tells us that the graph is heading for the location that has this as its x-coordinate and this as its y-coordinate. All right, back to part A again. We found that f parentheses 2 equals 3. That is f of 2 equals 3. That tells us there's a point on the graph at x, y equals 2, 3. And in part B, we found that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x was 3. So that tells us the graph is heading for the location where x is 2 and y is 3. Now let's go back to part A. In part A, we found that f of 3 does not exist. So that tells us there is no point on the graph where x equals 3. But in part B, we found that the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x was 4. What does that tell us? That tells us that the graph is heading for a location, location that has that number 3 as its x-coordinate and that number 4 as its y-coordinate. Since the graph is heading for that location, but there is no point on the graph at x equals 3, this tells us that there must be a hole in the graph at that location. Now let's ask this question. Do these results make sense? Uh, let's consider the graphs of, uh, of our function f of x and a very similar function g of x, which is g of x equals x plus 1. Now, a lot of you probably think that these two functions are the same, that you just cancel the x minus 3s and you get uh, f of x equals x plus 1 and you get g of x equals x plus 1. But, they're, but we have to work with these formulas. And let's just see what happens when we work with these formulas. Let's let's make a table of values for both functions. Table of y values. All right, there are the y values for the uh, function f of x. And notice that in almost all the cases, we could cancel some terms. But in the case when x was equal to 3, we could not cancel because we ended up with a 0 over 0. And you cannot cancel 0 over 0. Now let's compute the y values in the graph of g. 
So we see that the y values on the graph of g are exactly the same as the y values on the graph of, of f at all x values, except with this x value. Those two functions have different y values when x equals 3. The, the graph of f does not even have a y value when x is 3. So these are not the same functions. So again, the, this function uh, here is not the same function as this function here. They are different functions because there is a y value, there is an x value where those two things have different y values. Okay, so let's use this data to make graphs of these two functions on separate axes. So the left graph is going to be f of x and the right graph is going to be g of x. Now the graph of g of x is easy. It's a straight line with slope 1 and y-intercept at the point 0, 1. And all of these numbers that we computed in this table here can be used to make points on the graph. So there's a point 0, 1, there's a point uh, 1, 2, and so forth. So we can plot all these points. They all lie on this line. So notice in particular that this graph has a point at 3, 4. Now how do we make the graph of f of x? Well, we have uh, all of these xy pairs that we can plot, except we don't have a y value when x equals 3. So all of those xy pairs are exactly the same as the xy pairs on the graph of g. So those are all those points that we found y values for. Now what happens when x equals 3? Remember that we have um, the graph heading for the location 3, 4. There is no point on the graph at that location, but the graph is heading for that location. So we put a little open circle here, and we realize that at all other x values, when we compute the y values in the graph of f, going to get the same as the y values in the graph of g. So this graph has a hole at x, y equals 3, comma 4. So again, these two functions are not the same functions. They have graphs that look uh, identical except one of them has a hole at 3, comma 4 and one of them has a point at 3, comma 4. So um, that reflects the, the fact that f of 3 does not exist, but the limit, the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x is the number 4. So the graph is heading for that location. So there's a hole in the graph at x, y equals 3, 4. Um, so again, I want to stress that uh, the above tables uh, tell us that f and g are not the same function. That is, these two expressions are not equal. But the expressions do have the same limit. And that's a manifestation of this important fact that I said is the most important concept of the first month of the course, which is this. When can you cancel terms and, and why can you cancel terms? Notice that in all of these examples that I did, uh, I explained um, why you can cancel. Before going on, I'd like to make a note of two common mistakes that students often make when computing limits. So let's consider the question that we had in example 1b. We had um, this function, f of x, and we were supposed to find the limit as x approaches 3. Now remember, we know what the answer to this is. The answer to this is the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x is the number 4. But let's consider two sample solutions. Here's uh, Alice's solution. Alice computed the limit of f of x by doing this. And she did this. And she got this result. So Alice got a different result from us. We got an answer that the limit was the number 4. Alice got the answer that the limit does not exist. So who's right? 
Well, um, let's think about Alice's steps. This step is not allowed. So when you're computing a limit, remember we have this theorem, theorem 3, that um, could be kind of summarized in the following way. If, if you have a rational function and substituting in the x value doesn't cause any problems, does not cause the zero to become the, the denominator to become zero. If that's the case, then you can just go ahead and substitute in the number. But if substituting in the, the x value causes you to get a zero in the denominator, then you're not allowed to substitute. So since that equal sign is invalid, all of this stuff is invalid. So that's Alice's solution. It's invalid. She got the wrong answer. Now let's look at Bob's solution. Well, look, right away we can see that Bob got the right answer. He got the number four. So it seems like Bob did the right thing, right? Well, wait a second. Look at what Bob did. This equal sign is not valid. So you're not allowed to do what Bob did in that step. Well, so why did Bob get the right answer? Well, for that, let's think about, let's look at this equal sign here. To the left of this equal sign is this expression, which is 0 over 0. And Bob replaced that expression with this expression. So that's not allowed. What Bob did is he canceled 0 over 0, and you can't do that. You cannot cancel 0 over 0. So even though Bob got the right answer, his solution is actually worse than Alice's solution because he made two mistakes. So both solutions are invalid. For our next example, we're going to be considering another rational function, f of x given by this expression in standard form on the left and in factored form on the right. And uh, same kind of setup as in the previous example. We're going to find some y values in question a and find some limits in question b. So let's compute the y values. So f of 1 is the number 0. Now let's compute f of 3. So f of 3 does not exist because we cannot divide by 0. Now let's compute f of 5. So f of 5 does not exist because we cannot divide by 0. So we cannot cancel 0 over 0. Again, that's that very important concept of the first month of the class. Now let's compute the limits at those same three x values. First, let's compute the limit as x approaches 1. All right, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x equals 0. Notice that in this limit, we were able to cancel terms. That simplified our limit. We were able to cancel because we knew that the terms that we were canceling were not 0. And I explained when I wrote down the limit uh, solution, I explained why we knew that we can cancel. And then we ended up with a limit of an expression that was a rational function. And because the rational function has x equals 1 in its domain, we can just simply substitute in x equals 1. All right, now let's find the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. Uh, 
All right, so this limit starts out the same way as the one just above started out. But at this point, notice that the limit of the numerator would be the number negative 2. The limit of the denominator would be the number 0. So let's write that down. So the limit of the numerator is the number 2, and that's not 0. But let's look at the limit of the denominator. The limit of the denominator is 0. Well, we have a fact about limits. We have a theorem, theorem 4, that says if you have a limit of a quotient and the limit of the numerator is not 0, and the limit of the denominator is 0, then the limit does not exist. So let's go back down to our work in progress. This limit does not exist by theorem 4. So that's the first time we've had a limit that does not exist uh, using theorem 4. Now finally, let's consider the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x. So that's that important step where we have factors in a limit that we can cancel. We have to explain very clearly why we know we can cancel. Now at this point, we have a familiar situation. We have a limit of a rational function and the limit is being taken at a x value that is in the domain of that rational function. So theorem 3 tells us that we can just simply substitute in that x value. So let's summarize our results of parts a and b. Now I see we've got a typo here. This should say the function is f of x equals x minus 1, x minus 5 over x minus 3, x minus 5. So in part a, we found that f of 1 equals 0. This tells us there is a point on the graph at 1 comma 0. And in part b, we found that the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x was equal to 0. So this tells us that the graph is heading for the location 1, 0. All right, in part A, we found that f of 3 does not exist. So this tells us there is no point in the graph where x equals 3. And in part B, we found that the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x does not exist. So this tells us. Um, as x approaches 3, there is no location that the graph is heading towards. There is no x, y location. Uh, we don't know yet how this will look. But the factor is, the, the behavior is caused by the factor of x minus 3 in the denominator. the bad behavior is caused by the 1 over x minus 3 factor. So in earlier we found that f of 1 equals 0. We found that there's a point in the graph at a 1 comma 0. This is an x-intercept and it's caused by this factor x minus 1 in the numerator. Now finally let's summarize what happens uh, at x equals 5. We know that f parentheses 5 does not exist. f of 5 does not exist. So this tells us that there's no point on the graph at x equals 5. But in part b we found that the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x equals 2. This tells us that the graph is heading for an xy location with the x coordinate of 5 and the y coordinate of 2. So if we combine those two things, we see that um, there's a hole on the graph with uh, coordinates 5, 2.
And this hole is caused by the fact that we had a stack of identical factors. Notice that those factors caused the y value to not exist at x equals 5, but we were still able to compute the limit. All right, that's the end of this video. Thank you.